One of the things that leaps from the pages um, is the influence of two very strong women in your life, your mother and your wife. Would you like to talk a little bit about the role of women in your life? <laughs> I think you have to say uh, six of I would talk of these two women, uh, the role of, of these two women. <laughs> as far as my mother is concerned, yes indeed, she, uh, I think when I was a very uh, young boy and uh, living in Turkey, she was the one who thought uh, I ought to join the army at, uh, when I was just about 10 years or 11 years old. And uh, she had her reasons, uh, maybe that I was not too keen on studies and she thought that I, uh, army is a career where you don't have to study that much. She was very wrong on that count. But she did influence me to join the armed forces and I did uh, subsequently. So I think she was a strong woman who could exercise influence on, we were three sons. Uh, I, she said, uh, I should go to the army, the younger one go, becoming a doctor and uh, uh, my elder brother becoming a civil servant. All three of us went exactly where she wanted. <laughs> so, <laughs> as far as my wife is concerned, I can only say that she, uh, I think she brought some uh, sobriety into me. I was, uh, uh, I think I was quite an ill-disciplined person, frankly, let me ad admit. Sorry. And uh, she brought some sobriety and balance into my, uh, into me, and that held me in good stead subsequently in my army life, I think. So really, Mr. President, what you're saying is that when you were very young, uh, you were a bit of a wild child. And it's thanks to the army that uh, you gained significant discipline in your life. Did you ever have a vocation to the army apart from the influence of your mother? Well, I think the army certainly, uh, uh, we joined the army and I joined when I was just 17 years old and uh, certainly the army molds you and it changes you, it, it molds your personality uh, depending on where you have served and what all you have gone through. Now I have had a very uh, active uh, military life. I formed an, uh, an opinion there that uh, there is a very thin, there is a very thin line dividing cowardice and and gallantry, in that every self-preservation is a natural instinct. Everyone is scared. Anyone who says, I'm not scared at all, is certainly telling a lie. Let's move on a few years to when you now become a very senior officer indeed in the Pakistani army. And there's a passage in your book where you say, and I quote you now, only, the army is the only powerful stabilizing factor in the nation. And I thought of that quote when I read the New York Times today, whose front page story, lead story, is about General Kayani on Monday confronting President Zardari and Prime Minister Gilani about things that are not going so well in Pakistan. Do you think that Pakistan, how can I put this, is institutionally or structurally doomed, if that is the right word, to regular takeovers by the army to sort things out? Well, in, the, in Pakistan, we've got our own environment, really. In Pakistan's environment, certainly the army and the Air Force and Navy, the military, most of all army, because army is about 90% of the armed forces of Pakistan, is the only organized, trained, administratively sound body. Therefore, and it has obviously the power of the people of about, uh, we, have, we are about 500,000 strong army. Whenever Pakistan suffers, whenever the politically elected people, the politicians, democratically elected, are misgoverning, and Pakistan is sliding downwards, the people, it's the people of Pakistan who make a beeline and go to the general headquarters asking the chief to act and to save Pakistan. Unfortunately, the army does not have any constitutional role. That is the unfortunate part. And I have always believed that uh, in Pakistan's environment, if we want stability, if we want checks and balances, in the democratic structure of Pakistan, 
in the democratic functioning of government in Pakistan, the military ought to have some kind of a role, not interfering in politics. But that's why I created a National Security Council on the top uh, with a certain composition where the military was also there, military men. Because that is the only, I used to say, include them to exclude them from any takeovers. In the absence of such a thing, people running to the army and asking the army chief to do something, what does he do? There is no constitutional provision, yet people demand from him. And I know this, for one year I was the army chief before I became, I took over the country. Or I wouldn't say I took over the country, I was handed over the country by the, by the ex-prime minister. <laughs> uh, <We'll> <laughs> <laughs> Would you say, Mr. President, that today, 2010, General Kayani is wrestling with the same kinds of issues that you were wrestling with in 1999 uh, before you moved to take over the country? Well, well, you've seen his photographs sitting with the President and Prime Minister. I can assure you they weren't discussing whether they... <laughs> they uh, certainly were... There was a serious discussion of some kind or the other. And, uh, well, certainly at this moment, all kinds of pressures must be on this army chief. Uh, Mr. President, let's just, just wind back a bit now to uh, 1999. And Nawaz Sharif tries to sack you. And you then launched what you call in your book a counter coup to block it. You tell us a little bit about that, because weren't you on a, in a rather dangerous situation on an aircraft when the, when the news came through? Yes, uh, he, he didn't try to sack me, he sacked me. Uh, <laughs> didn't get him very far. <laughs> <laughs> he, he sacked me and uh, when I was, I was coming from Sri Lanka. In fact, he acted very clever. Absolutely, I didn't know what is happening. And then the drama unfolded, I said, you land, even if they are not allowing, let's go and land. He said, no, there are tenders, fire tenders across the runway. We can't land. So I said, okay, turn around, let's go to some other airport. He said, no, they are telling us all the airports are, lights are out, blackout, and you go out of the country. <laughs> and when I checked, where can I go? I could easy, either go to Doha or in India, Ahmedabad or some place. <laughs> An no, no, no. army chief uh, would have been the greatest booty in India. I mean, I'm a <laughs> in India. I might as well, as well have initiated a coup in India. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that is how things happened and uh, the army acted on the ground without, repeat, without any instruction or any order from me. On Friday, you're going to make a big political announcement in your capacity as leader of the All Pakistan Muslim League. Now, will you give us a sneak preview, please, <laughs> of what you're going to say on, on Friday? What I intend doing certainly on the first, to declare my joining the All Pakistan Muslim League, that I am part of this political party, and give my vision for Pakistan. I want to introduce a new political culture, democratic culture. And one of the elements is that I cannot put myself as the president. So I would much prefer that I'm going to join the APML as a member. And when the membership drive is there and when we form a council, let them elect me and tell me whether they want me as president. So therefore, I'm going on the path that I will be a member of the APML. Let us see then uh, what happens. Thank you, Mr. President.